We are a people prone to extremes. Instead of moderation, we typically swing the pendulum to either the far left or the far right. This certainly appears to be the case with church discipline in our local assemblies. As a reminder, we've been going through a series called Doctrine of the Church, in which we've discussed basically marks of a healthy church. We've discussed what is a church. We will review that this morning. And how do members of the local church relate with one another? How do pastors and deacons relate to the congregation as members of the church? So if you haven't been following, um, I would recommend that you go online to our website, calvarybaptistsc.church, where you can check out some of the previous sermons because this falls in line. They each build on one another. But again, I'll be giving some reviews um, throughout the message. But we swing the pendulum all the time in various areas of our lives. And the same is the case with church discipline. Written almost 80 years ago, Greek scholar H.E. Dana rightly states this. The abuse of church discipline is reprehensible, reprehensible and destructive, but not more than the abandonment of discipline. Two generations ago, the churches were applying discipline in a vindictive and arbitrary fashion that justly brought it into disrepute. Today, the pendulum has swung to the other extreme discipline is almost wholly neglected. It is time for a new generation of pastors to restore this important function of the church to its rightful significance and place in church life. So just quickly, we will define church discipline, take our time with it, and walk through the scriptures. But uh, for those who haven't been with us, we review the fact that the Bible, or Jesus, authorizes local churches and gives them the keys of the kingdom. So it's the local church, it's the membership, it's the congregation that has the final say or the final court of appeals on who's in and who's out. It's the local church that is to determine, does your confession match your life? And does your life match your confession? And is your confession a gospel confession? Is the, the confession of the scriptures. So church discipline is the utilization of the keys of the kingdom to say, although you profess to be a believer, you're in unrepentant sin. Therefore, the congregation has stated you're no longer a member. That's what church discipline is. An influx in the abuse of the keys of the kingdom, namely the authority to loose members, that's excommunication, and the ubiquity of a over-sentimentalization of love has led many of our churches to jettison the biblical doctrine of church discipline. Al Mohler, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, once said, the absence of church discipline is no longer remarkable. It is generally not even noticed. And unfortunately, this is the case. This may be the case. You may just ask yourself, have I even heard this term? Therefore, we must be cautious not to allow our experience to be authoritative in the matters of the church, but rather allow the scripture to be the guide that transcends culture and time. And since our faith isn't novel, I think it's helpful to consider churches and past generations and how they regularly engaged in church discipline. It's interesting that what, what would make an average churchgoer today say, my church would never do that? Would we? that seems hateful and loving, is the very thing that was considered necessary in order to be a true gospel preaching church in many centuries before ours. In 1561, Reformed Christians expressed their understanding of these matters in the Belgian Confession. They said this, the marks by which the true church is known are these. If the pure doctrine of the gospel is preached therein, if she maintains the pure administration of the sacraments as instituted by Christ, that's communion and baptism. And if church discipline is exercised in punishing of sin, in short, if all things are managed according to the pure word of God. So when Protestant Christians sought to reform from the Catholic church, 
they understood that they needed to define what a local church is. And they included the practical working of church discipline. So for them, a church wasn't even a church if they weren't practicing this biblical doctrine. So what's virtually absent in many of our churches today was considered necessary to be an authentic gospel preaching church. Now to be clear, history and tradition, they are not authoritative. It's not what I'm saying. As, product, uh, as Protestants, we are products of the Reformation, those who would push back against the idea that tradition is superior or even on par with Scripture. However, we must also remember that we have a cloud of many witnesses. Therefore, there's value in considering the normative beliefs and practices throughout church history. Greg Wills, professor of church history at Southern uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, he records the history of church discipline in Baptist churches in the 1800s. And here are some interesting statistics. In pre-Civil War days, Southern Baptists excommunicated nearly 2% of their membership every year. However, their churches continued to grow at twice the population growth rate. So this idea that church discipline will stunt the growth of local churches seemed to be unfounded. Now, to be clear, even with these examples, these churches had many issues regarding membership and discipline. Churches were accepting into membership slaveholders in a way that we would consider scandalous today, as we should. So, quick side note. This is why they hated Charles Spurgeon. My guy. You probably hear me quote him a lot. Call him the Prince, the prince of Preachers. The antebellum southern sl slaveholders hated Charles Spurgeon because he called out slavery as a wicked sin. He went so far as to say, I would not even have partake of the Lord's Supper with a slaveholder. So they hated him. And also, members were excommunicated for dancing. Shouldn't be the case. <laughs> so I'm not trying to over-romanticize these churches. I don't think you should be excommunicated for doing the cha-cha slide. But I do lament the pendulum swinging to what we see in our average church today. Now, before we consider what the Bible has to say on this subject, allow me to provide a gospel framework for church discipline. Now, without this framework, I don't think church discipline will make much sense. It will just seem cruel. It will seem mean, and therefore, you won't have a desire to practice it. Or you may even think of circumstances that you've seen in churches that you've been in that will lead you to say, if that's church discipline, I want nothing to do with it. Much, if not all, of us considering this framework will be us reviewing past sermons. So again, if you haven't been here, you'll get a, uh, not exhaustive, but a brief review. With that said, we'll look at four components that will help us build this gospel framework in which church discipline fits into. We'll look at the gospel, the Christian, the local church, and the membership. Membership in the local church. So let's start with the gospel. What is the gospel? Chances are, if you've been a believer for a fair amount of time, you've heard the gospel proclaimed at several different churches. There's often a subtle difference in how the gospel message is proclaimed based on the pastor's understanding of the gospel. Typically, the message, the, the message itself is closely aligned. God is holy, meaning he's set apart from creation and cannot tolerate sin or being in the presence of sin. We as humanity were created in the image of God, created to have fellowship with God, created even more uniquely than the angels. Although they are spiritual, they are intellectually superior they have more power. However, they were not created in his image. We were created in his image to be one with him, to have fellowship with him, to have relationship with him for all eternity. However, we sinned against God. Adam being our federal head, meaning he represented all of us the same way our uh, 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 governmental heads represent us. If our president goes to another country and makes a decision, it impacts all of us. Well, in the same way, the Bible says that Adam is our federal head. He made a decision, and it impacted all of us. 
But the Bible also teaches that he's our seminal head, meaning we somehow mysteriously existed in Adam. And when Adam sinned, we all sinned. When Adam rejected God, we all rejected God. So God is holy. He's righteous. He's perfect. And he's also a judge. The Bible says that there's coming a day where we all have to die and then comes judgment. Hebrews 9. The bad news is that there's nothing that we can do to offer anything up to God to be made right with him. You, you may have a human relationship where someone is angry with you, but you know all you have to do is get them this. Buy them a meal. It'd be all good again. The Bible says that we are spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to offer up to God. Spiritually dead. Therefore, the bad news is what we deserve for our law breaking, for our rejection of God, is his wrath or eternity away from him. You have to grasp that truth in order for the good news to actually be good news. But because God is love, he sent forth his son. The fall didn't catch him by surprise. God had eternal decrees before the foundation of the world that he would send his son to die for his people. And that's what he did. The Lord Jesus came in the flesh, lived a perfect life that was required of us, flawless, never disobeyed his parents, never thought a thought outside of God's will. And yet at the end of his life, he was treated as if he sinned every sin his people ever would. That's the cross. Something supernatural is taking place. That's why there's darkness over the land. God the Father is taking the wrath that we deserve and pouring it out on Jesus. He's our substitute. That's the gospel. And the gospel says that he didn't stay dead. He stayed dead. We would have to face the penalty of our sin. The gospel is that Jesus rose from the dead. His message was vindicated. He is who he said he was. He is who we thought he was. And now, the response. So that's the gospel message. Perhaps you're here, and it's the first time hearing the gospel message. Or perhaps you've heard it, but never responded to it. Well, I want to admonish you this morning, after service, either find myself or find a member. And please, allow us to explain to you how to properly respond to the gospel that you may know that you can be reconciled back to God. So there's the gospel message. This is the good news. Usually, again, we're looking at a case study of two different churches, of two different pastors who understand the gospel differently. Usually, that's the same. But here's the fork in the road. It's the response to the gospel. One may say, all you have to do is believe, pray a prayer, and you'll have eternal life. God is unconditionally loving. Just believe. Period. Not a comma. Period. Another... I would say more faithful presentation of our response to the gospel will say that anyone who repents, it won't leave out repentance, but anyone who repents and believes can have eternal life. And this eternal life begins today and it stretches into eternity. Therefore, salvation transforms you here and now. We're justified by faith alone, but faith is never alone. And that's because at the point of repentance and faith, the Holy Spirit indwells us and he causes us to walk according to his statutes, to walk according to his rules, although imperfectly. So God not only reconciles you to himself, but he reconciles you to the church, to the people of God. Do You see, the first version will have no place for church discipline. As a response to an unrepentant, professing a believer, the first gospel says, stop being judgmental. Once saved, always saves. This sounds a lot like legalism. God's love is unconditional. However, the second version has trained a congregation to understand that the Bible teaches the cost of following Jesus. They've heard that according to John 15, 2, the Father will cut off every branch of Christ that does not bear fruit because the gospel transforms lives. The second congregation won't shrug their shoulders when a professing believer is in unrepentant sin. No, they will go after them. They will call them. They will visit their home. They will call them to repentance because they know that sin is destructive. And ultimately, they'll understand how 
church discipline fits within this gospel framework. So that's number one in this gospel framework. What is the gospel? Number two, secondly, what is a Christian? Now, there are several ways to define a Christian. However, I think some of our definitions can be deficient and lead to confusion in other areas, especially church discipline. For starters, a Christian is one who places their hope and trust in the finished work of Jesus. Amen. But there's more to it. A Christian, by definition, is a corporate identity. A Christian has been placed into a universal body and is now an ambassador or representative of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. And this is a full-orbed understanding of the Christian, which is foundational, that we are representatives and ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, what is a local church? Just ask yourself that question. How do we define a church? It's not just 10 Christians meeting in a park. It's not just 10 Christians meeting at Starbucks for a Bible study. That's not a church. Jesus has authorized local churches to exercise the keys of the kingdom, thereby deciding who's in and who's out. That's the keys of the kingdom. We'll look at that momentarily. Much like Matthew 16, where the Lord Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? He answers, who do you say that I am? He gives his confession. You are the son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but this has been revealed by my father in heaven. Paraphrasing. And then he gives Peter and the apostles the keys of the kingdom. And then in Matthew 18, he gives the church the keys of the kingdom. So the keys of the kingdom is being able to stand before someone and determining, do you have the right confession and are you the right confessor? And then making an announcement or pronouncement from heaven. Again, 10 random Christians don't have this authority. Local churches have this authority. Now hear me out, because this is important. This is why formal church membership is important for this reason. In God's design, individuals by themselves are not authorized to declare to the nations that they are a citizen of the heavenly kingdom or that they are believers. Not on their own. They haven't been authorized based on the scriptures. Maybe this example will help. If your passport expires, while you're traveling in a foreign country, you have to apply to your country's embassy to have your passport renewed. The embassy has an authority that you as an individual do not have. Now, the embassy can't make you a citizen. You're a citizen or not. So the embassy doesn't make you a citizen, but it does declare your citizenship to the foreign nation. And you need that. As much as you may tell people in that foreign nation, I am a citizen, I am a citizen, you need the embassy to make that declaration on your behalf. In like manner, the local church does not make someone a citizen of God's kingdom, doesn't make someone a Christian, it can't offer salvation. However, a local church does what an individual Christian is not authorized to do, which is declare someone a kingdom citizen. That's why it's important to be members of local churches. That's what membership is. Membership is coming into a local body and that local church saying this is, they have the right confession, they have the right gospel, and their life matches their gospel. We bind you to this church. We declare to the nations via baptism that you belong to Christ. And that's why if you're a believer, being a member of a local church is necessary. Now, this doesn't mean that local churches will perfectly employ the keys of the kingdom because they won't. Nevertheless, they've been given this authority by Jesus. Think of parents. We do not perfectly exercise the authority that we've been given. Nevertheless, we are not without an authoritative mandate from God, even though we employ it imperfectly. In the same way, God has authorized and given local churches this authority. Second step in this gospel framework. 
or a third one, sorry. That was the third one. <laughs> Fourth one. And last, church membership. What is church membership? For the sake of time, I'm just going to remind you of Jonathan Lehman's definition of church membership I thought was helpful. Church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and the Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. That is church membership. After, after considering the gospel framework, my prayer is that church discipline, as we discuss it, will make sense with that as the backdrop. Now, before we dive into these texts on corrective church discipline, I have one more preliminary point to make. According to the Bible, discipline is an act of love and not hate. Although our, cur our current culture teaches otherwise. But we must allow ourselves to be shaped by God's word and not our culture. Now to be clear, these passages I'm about to reference aren't referring to uh, church discipline per se. But I just want us to reorient our minds regarding discipline itself. So consider these passages. Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. <laughs> but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Revelation 3.19 Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline so to be zealous and repent. Proverbs 3.12 For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father and the son in whom he delights. I like what Thomas White says. He says, Most churches would not claim to understand love better than God or to ignore the commands of scripture, but our actions speak louder than our words. The absence of church discipline demonstrates a lack of biblical love in churches. Again, let's not think that we can outdo God in love. Let's not look at what the scripture says and say, I know you command that, but I can love better than that. You can't. So without further ado, let's discuss church discipline. Because... Again, you may have a non-biblical understanding. You may just hear it and think this is something punitive, but it's not. Now, historically, Christians have discussed and understood church discipline in two, um, two terms, both formative and corrective. We'll deal with the former first. So, What is formative church discipline? Then we'll spend most time on corrective church discipline. But first, what is formal uh, church discipline? Mark Dever provides a compelling illustration and definition of formal or excuse me, formative discipline. It is the stake that helps the tree grow in the right direction, the braces on the teeth, the extra set of wheels on the bicycle. It is the repeated instruction to keep your mouth closed when you're eating, or the regular exhortation to be careful about your words. Every truth that you have ever heard someone talk about is a part of formative discipline. In other words, formative church discipline is always taking place takes place during the preaching of a sermon. It took place this morning in our adult and children's Sunday school class. It takes place every Wednesday when we come together via Zoom and pray and share scripture and give a brief exhortation or just via our prayers. Formative discipline is present when members come together and disciple one another by reading the scriptures. It occurs when a seasoned believer teaches a young man how to love his wife. It takes place when an older woman teaches a younger woman how to honor God and her husband. James 3.2 reminds us that we all stumble in many ways, therefore we're all in need of this formative church discipline. We see it in Acts 18. He, being Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Here's another way of looking at it. Formative discipline is like eating right and exercising 
while corrective discipline is like surgery. So the normative rhythm of life is that you will, Lord willing, eat right and exercise regularly. And Lord willing, that will preempt a surgery. However, we're not always in control of when we may need a surgery. Sometimes we have to go under the knife, which is no one loves that. No one is excited about surgery. However, sometimes it's going under the knife that saves our life. We as a church will lack maturity if we don't engage in intentional, formative discipline. And this is how we sustain a healthy and biblical culture of corrective discipline, by first ensuring that we're lovingly engaging in each other's lives. So in other words, formative discipline is discipleship. That's it. Think of formative discipline as discipleship. In another sermon, we talked about how members are to disciple members. Pastors are here to equip the congregation to disciple one another. But it's the role of the congregation to protect the gospel and disciple one another. Now, let's hone in on corrective church discipline. Again, our friend Jonathan Lehman gives a good example of this, or a good definition, rather, of this. And by the way, there's a book that I would recommend uh, authored by Jonathan Lehman entitled Church Discipline. It's one of the thin books in the Nine Marks Building Healthy Churches series for those who uh, desire further study. It's not a long book. I would recommend it. Let's, let's work on this definition and we'll go to the text. To define it more specifically, corrective church discipline occurs anytime sin is corrected within the church body and it occurs most fully when the church body announces that the covenant between church and member is already broken because the member has proven to be unsubmissive in his or her discipleship to Christ. By this token, the church withdraws its affirmation of the individual's faith, announces that it will cease giving oversight, and releases the individual back into the world. So let's consider biblical texts that teach corrective church discipline, which is also known as excommunication, which is the final step of church discipline. Church discipline and excommunication aren't necessarily synonymous. You can't use them interchangeably. Rather, excommunication is the final step when one does not repent. So first, let's just look at a biblical precedent for church discipline that we find in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 7. On the evidence of two witnesses, or I'm sorry, I should give you the background. So this is the Lord instructing Israel on what to do with an individual who was caught worshiping an idol. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to be put to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Paul is going to use the same verse, verse 7, when laying out excommunication. We'll get to that. So now let's just look at all the New Testament texts that teach church discipline. And then we'll like, plant our feet in 1 Corinthians 5, which is you know, the primary text we'll, we'll look at. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. You should, be, you should be familiar with this one. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he, does not, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. That should sound familiar, right? In the Deuteronomy passage, the two or three witnesses. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Notice what Jesus says there. This individual who refuses to repent of their sin, but yet they are professing to be a believer, Tell it to the church, and it's the church who, again, is called to protect the gospel, not just the pastors, but it's the church who is to treat him as a Gentile tax collector. Here we see excommunication. Galatians 6.1, brothers, if anyone is called in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Here we see that Paul wasn't just concerned with what is to be done in these situations, but how they are to be done. In the spirit of gentleness, we should not be joyous and gleeful 
when confronting someone in unrepentant sin. Should not make us happy. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 to 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person that have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Clearly, we see it not associating with someone as the essence of church discipline, which again we'll get to in more detail momentarily. First Timothy 1:20. Among whom are Herminus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Titus 3, 9 through 11, but avoid foolish controversy, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Combining all of these passages, plus with 1 Corinthians 5 that we'll um, consider here briefly, you see that God cares about local churches seeking to practice regenerate church membership. In other words, like, by definition, the church is the assembly of the redeemed. Membership in the church. It doesn't mean if you're not a believer, we don't want you here. As a matter of fact, if you're not a believer, there's no better place you can be but to be among the redeemed, hearing the gospel. My prayer is that you, if you are not a believer, that you would come to know the God that we worship and become a member of the local church. However, membership in the local church, as we've seen prayerfully in these texts, is that its job or her job, the local church, is not only affirming gospel citizens, we considered that in great detail a few weeks ago, but it's also removing those who profess to be a citizen of the kingdom but have the wrong lifestyle or who have the right lifestyle and reject the gospel or the biblical gospel. Now, this isn't for someone who just outright is a member and just, they tell you, I'm now an atheist, or I have now apostatized, I'm no longer a believer. Now, we just accept their resignation because they're telling you. This is for people who are professing to be brothers and sisters, professing to be Christians, and yet either have the wrong gospel, like in Galatians 1 manner, or are living in unrepentant sin, as we saw in Matthew 18, and we'll also see in 1 Corinthians 5. Now, this, this question we're going to consider now is when should we practice church discipline? This certainly demands wisdom from both pastors and congregations, although Scripture provides a few lists of sins that warrant church discipline. They aren't exhaustive. But if you combine 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 5, verse 11, chapter 6, and 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and by the way, there is, again, the transcript that we have. You can... Request it after service. I can give you a hard copy, but we also have a digital copy online. And all of the references and even some footnotes are, can be found there. But the following list is provided in these verses at least. So it's at least this. Sexual morality, adultery, homosexuality, theft, greed, coveting, which, uh, wickedness, deceit, envy, slander, pride, murder, idolatry, reviling, drunkenness, swindling, divisiveness, arrogance, abusiveness, ungratefulness, and blasphemy. And again, being unrepentant of these is what's key. Now, other sins could be added, but again, the point is not to create a, a set of sins in which we automatically pull the trigger. That's not the point. Corrective church discipline is ultimately driven by whether a church can continue to publicly affirm one's profession of faith as credible. In this sense, there's a difference between, say, a believer telling a lie and repenting of that lie and someone who professes to be a believer building their life on a lie and refusing to relinquish that lie. At that point, the first example is what we would expect because we all have the old man, the, the sin nature, Romans 7, Paul makes this clear. But in the second example, the Bible would make clear that Christians don't build their lives on unrepentant sin. So this is what the local church is looking to ascertain. Does this individual have a life that matches their confession? Or do they have a confession? Is it biblical, the right gospel that matches their life? Let's look at Matthew 18 once more before we plant ourselves in the case study of 1 Corinthians 5. Once again, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, the congregation, the assembly. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Notice how Jesus uses the witnesses principle in Deuteronomy to build his case. The, that Old Testament passage that we read, as well as, excuse me, in chapter 19, it's centered around judges hearing witnesses, then making a judgmental pronouncement regarding the individual in question. Then what we'll find in 1 Corinthians 5, again, our case study of excommunication, is Paul is going to tell this church, I have already judged this individual. That's the language Paul employs. That's what he says for the person who refuses to repent of sin. Well, there goes that idea that Christians are not to judge. That's, you won't get that in the Bible. I just ask you, get your theology from the Bible and not Tupac songs. That's who originally said that, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. I think he was. Only God can judge me. Is that true? Is that true? Jesus is saying, you are the judge. <laughs> now, oftentimes we judge the wrong people. Paul is going to say, I'm not, judging, I'm not calling you the judge outside, but those who are inside. And often we judge the wrong ways. He forbids a self-righteous type of judgment. However, as believers, as the local church, we're called to judge and discern whether or not someone has a credible confession of faith. Again, in that little book that I mentioned, Church Discipline, uh, Jonathan Lehman, he gives, I think, an incredible example of, um, yeah, we have the whole quote, of uh, basically the, the three elements that should be present in church discipline. I ask communication. The sin should be outward, serious, and unrepentant. The sin should be outward, serious, and unrepentant. And again, we'll see this in 1 Corinthians 5 momentarily. The sin must be an outward manifestation of, instead of just something like, he's prideful. Or she is greedy without any actual evidence, um, but just wanting to get someone excommunicated because you don't like them. That's not what this is for. The sin must be serious, so we're not pursuing every sin to the utmost. Again, we expect Christians to sin because we have a sin nature. And also, the Bible would say that we must overlook offenses. So we're not looking to try to jump to excommunication every time we're sinned against. That's why I said, like, that's the rhythm of life. You're going to be sinned against. You're going to be wronged. We are called to bear with one another and love one another through our sins. That's why, again, there's wisdom and there's prudence that must be present. Lastly, and most importantly, the sin must be unrepented of. If the person that you confront can, uh, uh, repents of their sin, praise God, you've gained your brother or sister. The aim of church discipline is not punitive in nature. Beware of churches and leaders who recommend discipline a repentant member just so that they can feel bad, or that they can feel shame, or so they can feel the weight of their mistake. That's not the point of excommunication, not the point of church discipline. Punishment is not the goal, but rather restoration is the goal. Let's see it, 1 Corinthians 5, which is our, our case study. We read Matthew 18, where Jesus gives the command, he gives the instructions on how to deal with these individuals. 1 Corinthians 5, we see it in action. This is the word of God. Paul writing to the church of Corinth. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that's not even tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you're arrogant? Ought you not rather to mourn? Let who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled or churched in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 
Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or idolaters, since then you need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, someone who calls themselves a Christian. If he's guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So here we see somewhat of the culmination of what we've been looking at throughout this entire text, or message, pardon me. Now notice that Paul bypasses the first three steps here, actually. He goes straight to excommunication. And this is probably because this man's sin was already so public and because he had become characterized and defined by this particular sin. So I stated earlier, prudence is needed in these matters so churches can decide how long or when corrective church discipline should take place. Perhaps it may take a church a few months, five or six months, to determine whether or not an individual is unrepentant. And for others, maybe it takes weeks. Each situation is different and should be treated uniquely. So again, there's a lot of wisdom and prudence that has to be deployed by local churches and their leaders. But based on these verses, let's just look at five reasons why we should practice church discipline. Five reasons why we should ch practice church discipline. One, for the good of the person disciplined. Notice what Paul says in verse 5. He says, you're to del deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So that means he's no longer a member, by the way. Which again, is just a really good lesson on why membership is important. Because... We talked about this in another message, but to be a Christian and to be a non-member of a church is to be delivered over to Satan. But he says, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So the aim is restoration. It's not punitive. It's not this guy, this person needs to be punished. We need to treat him horribly. No. We want him, we want him to feel the weight so that he can be restored. This individual believed that he, his relationship with God was not in jeopardy, even though he was in gross, unrepentant sin. And the church tolerated it. His church probably said, man, only God can judge him. Let's just love him. Paul says, no, you are harming this man. He is self-deceived. You're going along with his deception. Sin is destructive. And anyone who believes they can be an unrepentant sin and be a Christian is also deceived. Paul says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So judgment, rather, pardon me, ex, uh, excommunica excommunication church discipline is redemptive in its very nature. Like what D.A. Carson said about the Matthew 18 passage, the aim is not to score points over him, but to win him over. Because all discipline, even this private kind, must begin with redemptive purposes. So again, we don't celebrate when someone's excommunicated. No, we mourn. This is heartbreaking. But we also realize at times it's precisely what the doctor ordered, that this individual may repent of their sins. Christians, do you understand how hazardous, how dangerous sin is? Because if you don't, then church discipline and someone being unrepentant of sin won't mean much. But if you know that sin leads to destruction and death and will take you out, then you will do all you can so that the individual will repent of their sin and be restored. I've seen this. When I was in L.A., a friend of mine's church was at a <clears throat> member's meeting where they excommunicated a member, and no one was happy about it. The members were broken. One of the pastors was weeping. It's not a time of joy. It's a time of pain. But again, we know it's God's method of restoring also, as communication doesn't mean we treat the individually poorly. Anabaptists often went too far by treated, treating the excommunicated worse than non-believers. <laughs> we do want these individuals in our church services because we want them hearing the gospel. However, our relationship with them has changed. For one, they've been excluded from membership in the Lord's table. We don't treat them poorly, however, 
our relationship with them has to somehow change. If you're still casually watching basketball games with an individual who's been excommunicating, it's relaying the wrong message that everything is fine and dandy, that there's no problem. Listen again to what Paul says. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual morality, not even to eat with such a one. I'll let Andrew Fuller just sum this up. He says, if in individual members act contrary to this rule and carry it freely toward an offender as if nothing had taken place, it will render the censure, which is just the, the decision of the church, uh, no effect. Those persons also who behave in this manner will be considered by the party as his friends and others who stand aloof as his enemies, or at least as being unreasonably severe. So he's basically saying those who say, oh, that's all good, we can still kick it, they'll be like, oh, you're the real Christians. And those who are following what the scripture says, ah, oh, they're the enemies. And that's sending just the wrong message. We must act in concert or we may be as well do nothing. Members who violate this rule are partakers of other men's sins and deserve the rebukes of the church for counteracting its measures. So for good of the person, discipline. Number, reason, number one reason why we do it. Number two, for the good of other Christians as they see the danger of sin. See, the believers hadn't really, at Corinth, grasped the gravity of the weight of sin and the danger of sin and that it will actually ruin your life. That it destroys everything. All it took was one bite of one fruit to bring us to where we are now. That's what sin does. Therefore, when believers witness an excommunication, it's a wake-up call for us all to stay alert. We see this reality in the book of Acts and a unique type of excommunication. Acts 5 says, But Peter said to her, How is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. These are two members of the church. Immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Then verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. So after corrective church discipline takes place, we should always ask, where in my life do I have sin that I need to repent of? We begin to examine ourselves. So it keeps us from a self-righteous posture, but rather it, begin, it makes us begin to look inwardly, or it should. Number three, for the health of the church as a whole. Consider what Paul says in this passage. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are in leaven. And yeast represents uncleanliness or sin. So he's saying, lest we be careful, lest we don't remove the unrepentant sinner, this will begin to spread throughout the entire church. And if you know your Bible, you know that we see plenty of examples of this in the Old Testament with Israel. Number four, for the corporate witness of the church. When churches conform to the world, it makes our evangelistic task more difficult. When we reflect the world, they see us as hypocrites. So there's an evangelistic function connected to church discipline as well. 1 Peter 2.12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak of you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Lastly, fifth reason why we ch practice church discipline, for the glory of God. Just as we do everything, for the glory of God. John 14.15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We practice church discipline because we love God more than we love God people and we seek to put that on full display with our action in closing what's beautiful is when the sinner is restored what a beautiful picture of the gospel one who is unrepentant they seem callous they don't want to hear what the scriptures has to say on the matter they don't want to hear what you have to say on the matter they seem as if they don't care about their lives. Then God restores them, and they're brought back into the fold. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. Some believe it's the same individual in 1 Corinthians 5 that Paul instructs the church at Corinth to restore in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 7. says, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. This could be the same individual. Perhaps it's someone else who's ex 
communicate it. Either way, we should trust God's plan for restoration. If we had time. If we had time. And I know we don't. But if we had time, we would uh, go through a biblical theology of excommunication and church discipline. Y'all know I love biblical theology. love just tracing things from the old to the new. What's the first case of excommunication? Adam and Eve. Far from just being punitive, although it was that, there is a component there. God's aim was to restore humanity. There was an excommunication with the hopes, or it's God, so there's no hopes. It's like with the purpose of bringing humanity back in. So we get to model the gospel and God's plan of restoration through church discipline and prayer that God would bring the sinner to repentance and that they would be brought back into our fold. Let us as God's people trust his word and trust that he will do the work that he has promised to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We praise you for your word, Lord God. We thank you that we can plan, <laughs> we can have our own purposes, we can draw blueprints of what we will do. However, your word is what is eternal. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Therefore, as your local assembly, as your gathered uh, redeemed ones, I pray that we would follow scripture and allow it to convict us and allow it to guide us that it would be a lamp to our feet. Heavenly Father, we pray, first off, we're blown away by how you've authorized the local church to just utilize these keys of the kingdom. I pray we would do just that with wisdom. But I pray, Lord God, as a way to preempt this, that we could be serious about our formative church discipline. We could be serious about discipling one another. We could be serious about cultivating a culture in which we're vulnerable, we're open with one another, where we open up our lives to one another, so that when we see these areas of sin in each other, where the blind spots that we don't see in ourselves, we can lovingly, as your word says in Galatians 6, let him who is spiritual restore in a spirit of gentleness so that we can lovingly rebuke, lovingly correct, lovingly restore one another. So God, we pray for this culture here at this church. We pray that your word, again, would just be our God and that we would uh, be submissive to it. We pray these things by the power of the Spirit unto God the Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. It's a response to his word if you please. If